Hello and welcome to the History of Modern Greece. I'm your host, Daniel Roberts, and I'm here with my father, George, and our theme music is brought to you by Mark Youngerman. This is a podcast that covers the events from the fall of ancient Greece to the modern day. This is episode 40, Irene of Athens, the first empress of Rome. When we last visited the narrative of the Greeks, Emperor Leo IV died and left a lot of legitimate brothers eyeing the throne. He also left behind a very ambitious wife, who was the mother to the legitimate heir of the Roman Empire, even though her son was just a child. And this is where we're introduced to one of history's most influential women from the Byzantine era. This is where we meet the very first sole ruling empress of the Roman Empire, Empress Irene. Now, Irene of Athens has one of the most fascinating stories, not just in Greek history or Roman history, but human history. The fight this woman went through to get power and to keep it while the entire system was rigged against her is amazing. It wasn't just the fact that she was the first female emperor, but the fact that she almost reunited the Eastern and Western Roman empires. It just makes her story so interesting and pivotal in Greek history. Irene was born around the year 752 in the city of Athens. She was of noble birth and destined for a political marriage. It's very reasonable to assume that she was very beautiful because the emperor chose her specifically to be his wife. It's also very important to note that Irene was an iconophile which meant she was a person who worshipped religious images and icons, and she wanted to end iconoclasm within the empire forever, basically putting an end to the mobs of people running around smashing every piece of art and sculpture they could get their hands on. And as a fan of history and art in general, I despise iconoclasts or people who go around smashing art and statues. In 768, Leo IV married Irene of Athens. She moved to the capital, Constantinople, and away from the city of Athens. In 771, she gave birth to a son, later to be crowned as Constantine VI. In 775, Leo IV started to loosen up the persecutions of iconophiles. When I Iconoclasm was first kicked off by Leo III. The policy was against the icons, but not the people who worshipped them. It was Constantine V who really ratcheted up the persecutions, making the purge against anyone who had an image. So Leo was just reverting back to the stance of his grandfather, not really doing anything new. There were many scholars who attributed this to Irene's influence. And their reasoning stems from the obvious influence she had over her son when he came to power. However, there is zero evidence for Irene influencing Leo IV during this period, so it's all hypothetical, however very likely. In September 780, Leo IV died on campaign, and his son Constantine IV was only nine years old, so his mother Irene was named Regent until her son came of legal age to rule over the empire. Irene now had her first taste of absolute power. But the Roman army in Anatolia was iconoclastic, and it was in their best interest to have one of Leo's five brothers step in as an emperor instead. The idea of a female regent controlling the entire Roman empire was too much for many in the army and they would feel more comfortable with a male heir. Irene was a lone iconophile surrounded by extreme iconoclasts, and she had to be extra careful to survive this transition of power. She had very few, if any, allies in the army or the church. Irene began stacking the deck in her favor, And before making any policy changes that might ruffle the feathers of the noble classes, Irene started to systematically and very slowly remove iconoclasts from office and replace them with people personally loyal to her. Not her son Constantine VI, but Irene. 
Her first crisis came right away when Sicily revolted against the empire in 780. Irene appointed a man named Elpidius to be governor of Sicily and to bring them under control, keeping his wife and children in Constantinople. In 781, Elpidius revolted against Irene and supported one of Leo's brothers as the rightful emperor. Elpidius probably thought he was making the smart decision, as Irene was just a woman. But he was wrong. He was so very wrong. In fact, many men underestimated Irene of Athens and paid the ultimate price for it. Irene imprisoned Elpidius' wife and children and sent an order for him to return to Constantinople. Because he refused to return, Irene had his family dragged out into the streets of Constantinople and whipped in public. Still, Apidius refused the Empress's call and remained defiant in Sicily. Irene was left with no choice but to send an expedition to Sicily to apprehend Elpidius. Irene arranged one of the most important political marriages in medieval Europe. Her ten-year-old son Constantine, heir to the Eastern Roman Empire, was to be married to the Frankish Princess Rotrude, the second daughter of Charlemagne. Instructors were sent to Charlemagne's court in Aachen, where they taught her how to speak the Greek language. In 782, a fleet led by the patrician Theodore left Constantinople and set sail for Sicily. Once the fleet arrived in Sicily, it was over for Elpidius. Theodore beat the rebels in every battle, forcing Elpidius into exile. Unfortunately for the Romans, Elpidius took the treasury with him and fled to the Abbasid Caliphate, where he lived as an advisor to the caliphs. He was even known to have accompanied the Abbasid armies into Anatolia on several campaigns. This was the first crisis Irene faced, and it didn't end in her favor, at least not entirely. She was able to reclaim Sicily, but the loss of the treasury and Elpidius to the caliphate only made her enemies grow bolder. With Elpidius consulting the caliphate, an Abbasid army of 100,000 men, led by the caliph's son, Heron al-Rashid, crossed the borders and marched into Anatolia. As if things couldn't get any worse for Irene, the Armenian general fighting for the Roman Empire defected, joining the Abbasids. Irene had no chance at defeating both the Abbasids and the Armenians, so she capitulated to the Caliph's son. An expensive truce was signed between Irene and the Caliphate, with an annual tribute of 70,000 gold dinars per year for the next three years to be paid to the Arabs. This was an insane amount of money and it made a lot of citizens in the capital very unhappy. This capitulation was deemed a failure for the queen regent, making the situation for Irene even graver. With so many of her brother-in-laws eligible to claim the throne, she was at risk of a violent takeover, and it could come at any moment, from any direction. And now, there was a rebellion in the Peloponnese, and Slavic invasions from Macedonia. In 783, Irene sent the eunuch Styracius, her most trusted ally, to campaign in Greece. He proved to be very competent on the field and put down the Slavs in Macedonia, and then marched south into the Peloponnese to subdue the southern peninsula, which had been a contested region ever since the Great Sassanid War in 626. Styracius was extremely successful in his campaign and returned to Constantinople loaded with plunder. In 784, Irene had been regent for four years now and felt confident enough to push for her own candidate as patriarch of the Orthodox Church. She elected Tarasius, an imperial secretary who had not been ordained by the ministry. And you can imagine how many people saw this as a very bad precedent. Irene arranged for Tarasius to be ordained into the ministry and then immediately escalated to the top as the new patriarch. Irene and Tarasius were now the two most powerful people in the Roman Empire, and they immediately began work on restoring the icons. But before Tarasius made any moves, he made sure to stack the deck with delegates who were in favor of restoring the icons. And it took several years, but once he knew he had the right amount of supporters, he made his move. 
In 786, Tarasius opened a council on August 17th. He was going to make his move to restore the icons in the Church of the Holy Apostles. However, things did not go as planned, and iconoclast soldiers stormed into the council and broke it up. And this was a big deal. Never before had an army stormed into an ecumenical council. However, Irene and Tarasius were not going to roll over that easy, and a second council was held. So Irene declared a new campaign in the east, sending all the troops out of Constantinople and far away. As soon as the troops were in the field, she had the troops responsible for storming the council disbanded, and more loyal troops from Bithynia put in their place. In 787, at the second attempt of the Seventh Ecumenical Council, Irene had the location moved to Nicaea at the Church of the Holy Wisdom. Now this was a council not to debate, like the original Council of Nicaea, but was more to codify policy from Irene and Tarasius. The entire point of the council was to deal with the iconoclasts. And it was decided that all iconoclast bishops would be allowed to stay and maintain the posts so long as they denounced iconoclasm. Now this angered the iconophiles who wanted the iconoclasts to be completely excommunicated from the church. And while it may have upset the eastern iconoclasts, it strengthened the relationship between the Patriarch and the Pope. For some reason, and we don't know why, Irene ended the marriage between Charlemagne's daughter and Constantine VI. Either she was threatened by Charlemagne's growing empire, or she was afraid of her own nobles rising up in revolt, or maybe a bit of both. Either way, the dream of reuniting the Roman Empire was dead again. There was one person who was particularly upset at the cancellation of the marriage, and that was Constantine himself. Constantine wanted to marry Rotrude and actually fancied her. His mother was interfering with his future. To make the situation even more tense, Irene held a bride show for her son later that year and didn't even let him choose his own bride. At this point, Irene went from overbearing to just straight dictating, and Constantine VI was almost of age to take control as emperor. In 788, Charlemagne invaded southern Italy, and this territory was still owned by the Roman Empire. When Irene cancelled the marriage between Constantine and Rotrude, Charlemagne took it as a declaration of war, leading to the invasion of Byzantine holdings, starting in southern Italy. Irene basically angered the single most dangerous and powerful man in Europe, and at this time she had no idea he was going to be crowned emperor. And maybe he never would have been if the marriage wasn't cancelled by Irene. This was a major loss for Byzantine influence in Italy and further divided the Latin church from the Greek church. In 790, young Constantine VI turned 19 years old and was eligible to take over as emperor. Thus, Irene's time in the big seat was coming to an end. However, Irene did not see it that way. Instead of conceding the throne to her son, Irene decreed herself Augustus and her son Julius. Or rather, Irene was president and Constantine was vice president. It was a totally unprecedented move. Constantine VI was not impressed by his mother's actions, and neither were the noblemen of the capital. The real group of people who wanted to see Irene gone were the iconoclasts. Of course, it was only a matter of time before Constantine VI plotted to get rid of his mother. With a gain of iconoclasts supporting him, Constantine VI plotted to overthrow and banish his mother to Sicily. But Irene was strong and had spies everywhere in the capital, and she detected the plot and had her son, the emperor, apprehended. And she only released him after he swore an oath of loyalty to herself. Irene finally reached the limit of her ambition as a coalition of iconoclasts in Anatolia marched on Constantinople and restored Constantine VI to sole emperor. She was placed under house arrest at the palace of Eleutherus, palace of, U, palace of Eleutherus, along with her closest advisor. She was stripped of all her titles. She would remain under house arrest for two years. It looked like Irene's career was over and her time in the spotlight was done. 
With Constantine VI in power, the people were suddenly hopeful for the future. The iconoclasts were back in control, and a man was ruling the empire once again. However, Constantine was quickly tested when two enemies of the empire invaded at the same time, the Bulgars from the north and the Arabs from the east. And he suffered two major defeats and lost territory on both fronts, tarnishing his reputation as a competent ruler. Constantine needed allies if he was going to take on the Bulgars and the Arabs at the same time. Now, he wanted to reach out to the monastic branch and use their resources and influence to gain control in the empire. But in order to get on their good side, he needed to do something for them. And they really, really liked Empress Irene because she was an iconophile. In 792, Constantine VI reinstated Irene to the position of co-emperor. And this move made the monastics a strong ally, but it also cost him the support of the iconoclasts and the Anatolian army. This time, however, Irene was the second in command, and Constantine VI was in control. At least, that's how it started. Over the next five years, Constantine VI continued to make bad decisions that undermined his popularity within the capital. He finally made the move against his uncles in an attempt to remove any possible contenders to the throne. However, this move really backfired on him because it was well known that four of his uncles were extremely loyal to him and they had nothing to do with the one uncle that revolted against him and his mother. But despite this, Constantine had his uncle's tongues cut out despite them being innocent, eliminating them as potential rivals to the throne. This was a horrific move that alienated him with many nobles and military commanders. This was how Constantine respected his closest family. Imagine what he would do to a common politician. This could either be viewed as a twisted young emperor who was evil, or this could have been the influence of Irene on her son, in which case Constantine was a very weak man, and it was Irene who was evil. Constantine VI decided to divorce his wife. It was probably because he never even wanted to be married to her in the first place, and it was Irene who picked her for him. But because the church frowned on divorces, this made him even more unpopular. And Constantine was starting to lose support from every single angle, and it became obvious to everyone he was a sinking ship. And although this could have been Irene's doing from the very beginning, setting her son up for failure, the people started to look at her as a better option. In 797, Constantine VI marched his armies out to face Caliph Harun al-Rashid on the Eastern Front. While this was the Emperor's time to show how brave and competent of a leader he was, Constantine instead retired back to Constantinople and made himself look terribly weak and cowardly. In June that year, Irene had enough. She sent her men out to apprehend Constantine while he was riding through the capital but he managed to escape and fled to the east. While he struggled to gather allies to return to the capital, he was captured by Irene's men and returned to the palace. Irene had him imprisoned for several days before giving the order to have him brought to the tower and both of his eyes burnt out with hot metal pokers. This was a terrible punishment, but one all too common in this time period. However, the horrific fact that a mother could do this to her own son is something that can't be topped. Irene is the most infamous and horrible woman in history for doing this. The procedure must have been carried out extremely rough because Constantine died of his injuries several days later. Massive infection, I guess, eh? One important fact that we must understand is that all of our sources for Irene were written by iconoclasts who despised her. So there is a bias against her here and also the fact that she was a woman ruler in the early medieval ages, when there was a strong suspicion of women with ambition and power. These sources all assumed the absolute worst of Irene. And there is a possibility that Constantine 
really was an awful emperor who needed to be stopped. It wouldn't be the first time that a young emperor came to power who was cruel and wicked and just needed to be taken out. But it is also possible that she was a cold, calculating, power-hungry and ambitious individual who managed to seize the ultimate power in a corrupt and dangerous time in Greco-Roman history. As soon as Irene lost her heir, Constantine VI, she became vulnerable. Now everyone who was helping her started plotting to get their brother or cousin in line for the throne. Her fate was sealed. Constantine VI was Irene's major obstacle to total power, yet, ironically, it was also her only legitimate claim to the throne. With no son and no royal blood from the Isaurian dynasty, she was just an Athenian woman who married into the position. Her two closest allies in her reign were the eunuchs, Styracius and Aetius, and now they were constantly working against one another, destroying any cohesion in her regime. The blinding of Constantine VI was not a very popular move, and Irene immediately came under attack. The iconoclastic army in Anatolia nearly mutinied. They were loyal to the Isaurian dynasty and had been for over 80 years, ever since the War of 717. And now Irene had just snuffed it all out with red-hot iron pokers. And to make things worse, her enemies outside of the empire could sense her weakness and her vulnerability. The Abbasids began to raid into her territory, forcing her to capitulate and increase the tribute promised by her son in 791. Now this took care of the Arabs on her eastern frontier. And her next move was to keep the nobility in Constantinople by granting the super-rich all kinds of tax breaks. A very classic move when you're unpopular. Just give the rich money. She removed the tax on receipts, which was the most unpopular tax, as well as halving the custom duties. This was extremely careless, and everyone saw how desperate this move was. This money had to come from somewhere, and with all of these tribute payments to the Abbasids, the army was wondering whether or not there would be any money left over to pay them. Her reign was very unsuccessful once she was ruling alone. No one would work with her, mostly because she burned her son's eyes out, but also because she was a woman ruling the empire, and most men didn't trust her, or really any woman. They were very misogynistic back then, probably because of the church, and things were falling apart faster than she could pick them up. In 800, Charlemagne was crowned emperor. And this was a really big deal, because there hadn't been a Western Roman emperor since 476, over 300 years before. This was unprecedented and required legitimization. After all, there already was a Roman emperor in Constantinople. And this office had never fallen vacant like it did in the West. In order for Charlemagne to gain full legitimacy, he needed recognition from Constantinople. Charlemagne reached out to Irene and proposed a marriage to unite the East and the Western Roman Empire. Even though Charlemagne tried to arrange this 15 years earlier, he wasn't crowned emperor yet. And now Irene was way more likely to say yes because she was barely holding on to the throne herself. No one trusted her or believed her to be the legitimate Roman emperor in the East because she was a woman, and many looked at that throne as vacant. So this was Charlemagne's opportunity to seize control of the Eastern Empire. Irene carefully considered this offer, and might have actually been in favor of it. However, this wasn't done over email like marriages are arranged today. <laughs> Charlemagne had to send a messenger from Belgium all the way across Europe to Constantinople. It took a long time for this message to reach Irene. Word had made it to the nobles that Irene was considering a marriage with Charlemagne. 
and they had to act quickly before she handed the empire over to the Frankish barbarians in the west. It wasn't all just about reuniting the east and the west of the Roman Empire. It was about the political powers in charge remaining in power. And Irene marrying Charlemagne was literally giving over the keys of the empire to the German barbarians in the west. Irene fought and sacrificed her entire life to get where she was. And now that she finally had the power of the Roman Empire in her clutches, it was impossible to hold on to it. She is a champion of women everywhere. The first female emperor of the Roman Empire. She was a fighter. She was cunning and brave. And this is where we are going to leave the narrative. Season 1 brought us the history of the Greeks from the dawn of the Bronze Age through classical Greece and the Roman Empire. And a great place to leave it off is with Irene as the sole ruler of the Roman Empire, the most powerful person in the Greek world. Will she keep the power? No. No, she will not. But we'll get into that in the first episode of Season 2. We thank you for staying with us, and we hope you stick around for the next season. Well, that's it for today. Join us next time on the history of modern Greece. Stay safe and stay awesome.